Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. If Park Valley Church has been a blessing to you, we would like to encourage you to partner with us financially so that we can continue to spread the good news globally. You can do that online by heading over to our website at parkvalleychurch.com and clicking on the giving button at the top. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoy today's message. Sarah Daly is on our staff and God has really gifted her uh, to speak into the lives of the kids of this church, our student uh, ministry. She's going to come and share her story with you now. Let's give it up for Sarah. Good afternoon, church, and happy Mother's Day. Um, for those of you that don't know me, as Barry said, my name is Sarah Daly, and I work here in student ministries. And um, some of you may already know this about me, uh, but I absolutely hate failure. Um, you may even say that I have like a crippling fear of failure. Um, and there's a couple of things that are kind of wrapped up in that fear of failure. Um, the first thing is that I, I hate to be a disappointment. Um, that's part of the, the people-pleasing side of myself. I hate to, dis to be a disappointment to people around me. I hate to be a disappointment to myself. Um, it's just something that I have never really handled very well. Um, the other piece of, of my um, fear of failure is um, the fact that I always want to be the best. Um, I want, it's, it's a very prideful thing I know, but I, I want to, to, to be the best at whatever it is that I do. Um, that actually kind of plays a role in, in my marriage with my husband, where there are certain games that we are no longer allowed to play uh, because he beats me at them, and so we do not play them anymore. <laughs> um, but it was just uh, just a little over a year ago, pretty much a year ago um, to the day, actually, that, that Doug and I came home with our uh, precious baby girl, Audrey. And um, talk about, you know, a, a fear of failure going into that. I was, I was panicked, you know, that I, I wouldn't be um, enough of a mom for Audrey. That, that I wouldn't be able to provide for her in the, in the ways that I felt like I needed to. Um, I don't know if any of you, I'm sure there are several moms, new moms, expecting moms, moms who recently gave birth out there who have heard of a little something called a birth plan, yeah? Um, it's, uh, it's something that I think they've introduced within the past decade or so where you write out, you know, pretty explicitly all of the things that you want to have happen in the delivery room. It can be, you know, that I want aromatherapy in there or it can be I just want to have a natural delivery. And that's what my, what my plan was. And when it comes to a fear of failure, a lot of that has to do with a, a fear of, of expectations not turning out the way that I had wanted them to. And, uh, and I think God looked at me and said, Sarah, I don't want you to have any claim in that anymore. I don't want this fear of failure, this fear of not living up to the expectation. I don't want that to claim you any longer. So you're going to go through something where your expectations are going to fall apart. And everything that you thought that you wanted isn't going to happen, but I have something better in store for you. So after a 40-hour labor, three hours of pushing, an attempt to vacuum or suction Audrey out, my doctor looked at me and he said, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to have a C-section. That was the last, the last thing that I wanted for myself and for Audrey. I had heard, you know, stories, horror stories about what happened in C-sections, especially emergency ones. And luckily, in a way, it was an emergency one because we had to go right in, and I didn't have enough time to ruminate on exactly the things that could happen. But boy, did I dwell on them when I got out of it. And I had this beautiful, this beautiful thought, you know, before having Audrey that, oh, we would, we would nurse, we would do skin to skin seconds after her being born. And, and it will be this beautiful, tender moment of, 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 you know, connecting with this tiny little being that, that, that my husband and I created. But instead, I'm in a recovery room for two hours before I'm finally able to nurse her. And boy, talk about failed expectations because that was another one. Because you see, because of the C-section and a couple of other complications, the biggest one being that, that she just would not latch. Nursing was something that, that I just 
was unable to do for my daughter. And that was crushing. (laughs) To think that I could not provide for her most basic of human needs to be fed the way that everyone else was telling me to. The way the blogs, the articles, the pediatrician, the you know, the, the APA, everything was saying breast is best. And of course, the implication then is if that's best, everything else is worse. And that's the lie that I told myself. That was the, the, the path that I started down and, and the, the words of death that were being spoken to me until eventually I was so deep in a pit of postpartum depression. And finally, the light that got me out was the verse in Romans 8.1, which my therapist shared with me. And she told me, Sarah, there is no condemnation for those who have a belief in Jesus Christ. And that is so true. Jesus does not look at me and say that, that I am unworthy or I am not enough or that shame on me for, for not nursing my child or shame on me for having to have a C-section. Instead, Jesus looks at me and says, beautiful, wonderful daughter, I love you and I'm proud of you. He looks at me and he says, I love you. And I sent my son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you while you were still a sinner, while you were still racked with shame and guilt and condemnation and feeling unfit for this job of motherhood. I still wanted my son to die for you. And when that realization hit me, it just changed. It was a, a game changer because now I could parent and be the mother who is living that promise out for her husband and her and her child. I am a living example that Christ tells me that I am enough, that I am worthy. And I just want to ask you moms or sisters or daughters who are sitting in this room today and feeling feeling shame, feeling condemned, whether it deals with motherhood or not, what, how, how would it change your life to be able to look in the mirror today and say, Jesus does not condemn me. He says, I am enough. He says, I am worthy. He says, I am loved. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for sending your son to die for us so that we can see and live in the freedom that you provide us, Lord. That our choices or the choices that were made for us do not bring condemnation through the birth and death of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for showing us that we are enough, that we are loved, and that we are worthy. So, uh, um, obviously, um, my wife is going to be speaking today, Christine, and um, we've been married for 28 years, and she actually spoke, yeah, amen. Um, <clears throat> she actually spoke last Mother's Day, and I think I'm still hearing people talking about last Mother's Day. People will come up to me in Walmart and say, you ought to have your wife talk again. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, you know, or whatever. Um, but anyway... Uh, just to, to hear a mother's heart and to, um, you know, obviously she has been such an amazing wife to me over 28 years and, and going to all these different places to do ministry and coming here to start the church and do all these different things and, you know, dragging the kids along and, and, uh, and also just an amazing mother. Uh, so she just did a phenomenal job loving those boys and raising those boys. And, um, but anyway, I'd like for you to give a warm welcome to Christine as she comes. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Um, Every time I get up here, I'm like really freaking nervous. (laughs) So um, I, you know, I definitely feel like I'm unqualified to talk to all of you, and I'm sure most of you are probably way better mothers than I've ever been. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm just a mom trying to make it through life just like everybody else. And 
um, you know, in thinking about what I was going to speak on this week, um, it was, I was kind of having a really stressful week, and so as I studied and prayed about what I was going to, you know, talk about, I really had a hard time getting my thoughts together, and um, so initially I had written something out totally different, and then Friday, um, like two days ago, um, I felt like God was leading me in, to speak on something totally different. So I'm just going to share what God has put on my heart, and I hope that it'll be a, a blessing and an encouragement to you. Um, so when I think about my mom, um, I think about what a great example she has been for me. And as far as moms go, um, I think I got really lucky. I look back at the way she raised me and my siblings, and I can't help but be grateful for everything that she has done for me. Uh, in the birth order, I am number five of seven kids, and pretty much things were chaotic, stressful, and at times even dysfunctional. Um, we were not the perfect family, but my mom always remained faithful. Um, she has taught me some very important things that I've tried to model and emulate for my kids. And the first thing she taught me was to have a, a strong work ethic. Proverbs 13, 4 says, lazy people, want much, lazy people want much but get little, but those who work hard will prosper. When I was in elementary school, right around, um, I think about fourth or fifth grade, um, my mom started working outside the home. And I don't remember a time that she called out at work. So she if she had a bad cold or a cough or wasn't feeling well, she still went into work. If there was a snowstorm, she went into work. So she just really had a great work ethic. And I think it's really important for us to teach that to our kids. Sometimes we struggle with making them do things that are hard. I've come across so many adults who make excuses for their kids or always try to fix things for them. And how many of you have gone through this? Um, when Michael was in middle school, the school nurse and I were on a first-name basis. <laughs> um, Gainesville Middle School, Kathy was the nurse at the time, and Kathy would call me and say, I have Michael here in the office, and he's not feeling well, so he wants to talk to you. Well, I had two questions that I would always ask Kathy on the phone. The first one was, does he have a fever? No. Is he throwing up? No. Okay, well, you can put Michael on the phone. So Michael would get on the phone, and he would basically plead his case and beg me why he was feeling so bad and wanted to come home. So my next statement to him was, you know, and it would have been easier just to pick him up and blah, 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 whatever. So my next statement to him, and this is what my mom always said to me, and you know how you always go through those things, and I'm never going to do this like my mom, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be totally different. But my next statement to him was this. If you're sick enough to come home, go right to bed with no TV or video games for the rest of the night, then I'll pick you up from school. And can you guess what he did 99 times out of 100? He's like, I'll stay, I'm okay. So um, I, I think it's okay to make kids do things that they don't want to do. I don't think we always have to give into the pressure of whatever our kids want all the time. It teaches them that being disciplined and working hard is something that builds character. As moms, we want our kids to succeed and do well in life, but sometimes we need to realize when we need to let them fail, when to let them learn those hard lessons in life that will mold and shape them into responsible, caring adults. The second thing my mom taught me was what it means to sacrifice. When you're a kid growing up, uh, you don't normally think about where things come from or how you have all of the things that you have, you know, the clothes you have, the, the things that they, they do for you. I know I certainly didn't. And I got to thinking about all the ways that my mom has sacrificed for her family over the years. Most of us moms would give everything that we have for our kids. And I just thought of a few of the things that we do to, to make sacrifices for our kids. Um, 
and Sarah mentioned a little bit, but one way is how our life changes when we bring home a newborn. You become sleep deprived, your body changes, your freedom changes, your bank account changes, and that doesn't get any better. Um, I think about the times that we're up in the middle of the night with multiple kids who are sick and barfing their guts out, um, you know, taking care of them, that sacrifice. I think about the late night talks with your teenagers. Um, you know, I, I am not a night owl at all. So basically, right around 9.30, if I'm, even if I'm standing there talking to you in mid-sentence, my eyes are starting to close. So I, about 9.30, I just, I'm kind of done. But with teenagers, at least with mine, it seems like at night, that's when they want to talk, and that's when they start to open up. So even though I knew my alarm would still be going off at 5 a.m., I, you know, I thought it was important to make that sacrifice and take the time to listen to what they had to say and what was on their hearts. Another thing that uh, I think that we sacrifice to do for our kids is, is helping them with, with schoolwork and school projects. And I know with SOLs and all that stuff going on, exams towards the end of the year, it's, it's hard. And uh, I think about reading with a kid who hates to read it's not fun. Um, doing math homework with a kid who struggles in math, you know, it, it can be very stressful in a fight sometimes. It's, it's hard. It's not easy. And, you know, one of the big things for me, I don't know if this is just like a pet peeve of mine or whatever, but one of the big things for me is helping kids with their science fair project. <laughs> um, and I have to tell you, I think that the science fair is from the devil. <laughs> um, sorry for all you science teachers out there. But with four kids, um, we could have several projects going on at the same time. And every, like always, always every time, we would be finishing up the night before. Uh, if we ever had a project that we were working on that was done in advance, maybe like a week in advance, it was because one of the kids got the due date wrong. <laughs> and so, you know, it, I was the, the project mom. So there, I think there's always one in every household that's designated to help the kids with projects. So I was the project mom. So anytime they had something, you know, I'd be working with them late into the night, typing papers, helping with science fair, and... And Barry would be like, okay, honey, just let me know when you need help. <laughs> and click in the clicker. But <laughs> see, there is one in every household. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's funny because I would always ask the kids, you know, hey, what grade did I, I mean, what grade did you get on the science fair? <laughs> so, um, you know, it's sacrifice. It's a lot of time and effort to help your kids with things like that. I also think about the hundreds and even thousands for some people, and I calculated it, and it's, it's very possible that there are th you can spend thousands and thousands of hours taking your kids to extracurricular activities. Um, you know, when they get their license, it's like, yes. You know, you finally get a break. But, you know, sports practices, their games, dance recitals, cheer practice, music lessons, school plays, chorus concerts, we run around like crazy, making sure that our kids have every opportunity to, opportunity to excel. And that's sacrifice. I think sacrifice looks different in every family. Um, sacrifice for one mom may be staying home with your kids. Another, another mom, her sacrifice may be going to work to help provide for the family. My mom... is one of the most selfless people I know. Not to get into all the details of it, but um, she and my dad basically raised all four of my sister's kids. Two nieces and two nephews. After they had already raised seven children of their own. Talk about selfless. And I can tell you that 
never once, I mean never, did I hear her complain about it. She did it joyfully and with absolute unselfish love. I think this next verse fits my mom completely. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. The third thing, and I think the most important thing that she taught me, is the importance of having a strong relationship with Christ. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, we lived there till I was about 12 years old. And when I was around seven, a man came by our house and invited us to church. We had, um, they had a bus that came through the neighborhood and would pick up kids and bring them to Sunday school. So earlier I told you that I am from a family of seven kids, so my mom thought this was a fabulous idea. <laughs> so she could have all of us kids out of the house at the same time. Um, so we all, all of us kids started riding the bus and attending church. And after several months, we started asking my mom and dad to come. And it took a little bit of time, but they finally agreed. And both of my parents attended church and accepted Christ. The transformation that, that God did in their lives was amazing. From there on, our family attended church together pretty much every time the doors were open. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. Over the years, I watched my mom's unwavering faith through family issues, financial struggles, and illness, and she's still struggling with illness. Yet I never saw her freak out or lose sight of God's blessing and provision. Throughout my adult years, I've gone to her for advice or her opinion on things, and she's always given me godly counsel and instruction. It may not have been always what I wanted to hear, but it was always godly counsel and instruction. And that's what I want to pass along to my kids, living a life that is Christ-centered and full of faith. I also wanted to kind of touch on something else as I start to wrap things up. Um, you know, mothering is an honor, but not all of us view Mother's Day the same. I talked a little bit about this last year, and I just wanted to kind of reiterate that Mother's Day brings on different emotions for everyone. And, you know, after I did speak last year, many women came up to me and shared their struggles about motherhood. You know, some women were struggling because they were unable to have children. One person told me that it was really hard because she was a stepmom, not a biological mom, yet she still had all the motherly duties. One woman had just recently lost her mother to cancer. Another mother shared that she was heartbroken over the challenges she was facing with her rebellious teenager. Life is complicated. Family and relationships are complicated. And as I talk to these women, I learned that the common thread in every one of us is that we're all going through something. Being, being a mom is so rewarding yet so incredibly hard. We look around and we see other families and we think that everything's perfect for them. We see the pictures on Facebook. We see that, we think that their kids are perfect, their husband is perfect. They live in this beautiful house and I never see them frazzled or, or arguing with each other. It just, they all seem so perfect. But in reality, if we are all honest, we would admit that no one has a perfect family. You may think that somebody's family looks great from the outside, but if you just had the opportunity to kind of just lift the roof off and really kind of peer in and see, you would most likely see that they're struggling just like the rest of us. You know, I sometimes wonder why we do this. 
Why do we set unrealistic expectations for ourselves and for our kids? I'm completely guilty of this. I do this all the time. No one wants to admit that they're struggling or failing. We all want to be that perfect mom. Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2 says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. You know, as my kids get older and I look back at what I've experienced and learned, I think we all just need to stop being so critical of ourselves and of others, you know, and come, along e- come alongside each other and be an encouragement. Um, we, we say this over and over again at church, but I really honestly believe that um, being in a small group is one of the most amazing blessings in my life. The women in my small group are one of my greatest supports. I think we all need that support in our life um, as we're going through all of these struggles that everybody has. And over the past couple years, I've developed relationships with these women that is beyond anything that I can explain. We don't just meet weekly for our small group and then just go our separate, separate ways, but we truly share life together, the good and the bad. And I know that I can go to any of them um, for absolutely anything, and they will do whatever they can to help, as well as cover me in prayer. Philippians 4, 6 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. You know, being a mother, you know, we all kind of have these Cycles we go through, oh, you know, if I could just get past the newborn stage, if I could just get past the toddler stage, if I could just get my kids in school, um, you know, we all are kind of looking forward to that next stage. And I don't think being a mother doesn't stop when your kids move out of the house. I actually think that mothering is harder now than it was when my kids were little. Um, The problems are bigger and most of the time more expensive. Um, We don't have the same control over things that we did when the kids were at home. And one of the greatest things we can do is pray for our kids. I think a lot of times we feel like things are out of control or out of our control. But the greatest thing we can do is pray for our kids. I've come to realize just how powerful prayer is and praying for your kids. It's one of the greatest privileges that we have as Christians. We have direct access to God through prayer. Um, James 5.16 says, The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Moms, pray for your kids. There are so many challenges that they face that we never had to experience when we were young. Ask others to pray for you and with you. Pray in faith, believing that God is going to answer. And I really just wanted to encourage every mother that's here today. Thank you for everything that you do. Your hard work and the things that you do for your kids do not go unnoticed. You make up a very crucial part of our lives, and we appreciate your unconditional love. You're an incredible gift to your children and to the countless lives that you impact on a daily basis. Thank you to all the moms. You rock. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute. You know, there's a a simple story that everything revolves around here at Park Valley, and that is what you crave deep in your heart. You crave a relationship with a father. You crave a relationship with God. And, you know, so many times we're convinced that it's so many other things. We crave this car. We crave this job promotion. We crave a relationship with this person or that person. But we, you know, figure out eventually that none of those things ever satisfy. I mean, you know, the house that we think is, you know, all that starts breaking down, falling apart. The car you think is amazing, you know, also falls apart. The relationship that you think is everything just about a a month later drives you nuts. 
you know, the, the job that you think is amazing causes you to live most of your life on 66. And, and just all of these things, you, you think, wow, it wasn't what it was cracked up to be. And the reason is because there's an emptiness in your heart and what you really crave is God. That's why one of the most important verses in the Bible is when Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody cometh unto the Father except by me. The only way you're going to truly have a relationship with the Father is by believing in his Son, Jesus. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is the way. Jesus and his death on the cross and the fact that three days later he rose again from the dead is the answer. That's why everything that we do at this church is in basically so that we can introduce people to Jesus and so that Jesus can change their lives. That real, true life change that Christine was talking about with her mom and dad, that's all Jesus. And the same thing can happen to you. He can do a miracle of life change in your life. And it can be right here, right now, today, on Mother's Day. So if you're here today and you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to take away your sin, can I just say that the cross is the bridge? The cross is the bridge between sinful people and a holy God. You see, nothing else can bridge the gap. You can't do it on your own. You can't be holy enough and righteous enough on your own to do it. Jesus is the only one that can get you to a relationship with God the Father. And so I'm asking you to do something very simple. I'm asking you to believe. I'm presenting you with the truth of the gospel. You are the one that gets to decide whether or not you believe it. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about, well, you see, uh, the law of physics, you know, whatever. Do you or do you not believe that Jesus is the Messiah? And if you believe in him, I'm telling you right now, he'll change your, change your life. So if you'd like to, just say a simple prayer and invite Christ into your life if you've never done that before. I want to lead you in a prayer right now. I want you to pray something like this. Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know this from the bottom of my heart. I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. And I receive Jesus as my Savior. And I'm still trying to figure all that out. All I know is I've learned that Jesus is the way. And so I receive Christ as my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Help me, Lord, to live my life for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.